Hello, and welcome to the Haiku P podcast, episode 18 of the fourth series. This time we worked on writing Haiku and Senryu with place names. The idea was first introduced to us by Richard Tice, and it was a fascinating topic. You'll find that we've been all over the world, and I have to tell you, it was jolly difficult and time consuming to edit. Has Google ever been used as much as it was to edit this episode? Now for the good news. Those of you who are on our mailing list will already know the Summer Journal is out. Those of you who aren't really should sign up for it. I love the colour this time. And of course, the content is great. It's a bumper issue. It's really, really huge. Thank you to everyone for taking part and I hope I've done it justice. It's available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle form, and there is a link in the show notes and, of course, on the website, on the journal page. I've got a couple of quick reminders for you. Next time, we're going to be writing long haiku. If you haven't got a clue what that is, you haven't listened to Mark Gilbert, who came along in episode 17 of this series to talk about it and to give us some excellent examples. You can read them in the show notes, and you can listen on the podcast, or, of course, there's a YouTube presentation. Everything is accessible through the Poetry P website, or you can go to YouTube. The submission period for Long Haiku is the 1st to the 20th of October, 2021. Now, I need a video for the PTV Haiku prompt for October, It's really, really easy to do with your phone. It should be taken in landscape mode and about 20 to 30 seconds long. You can Google Drive it or Dropbox it to me. And if you've not seen this month's video by Robert Horobin, please do go to our YouTube channel and have a look. Write some poetry and comment on the poetry of others. It's a great exercise and a very, very lovely video. Thanks, Robert. Nick Hoffman, I'm so sorry, but despite my checks and balances for each podcast, I messed up and I left your wonderful poem out of the Yugen podcast. Words really can't express how sorry I am, but I can at least make up for it, a little, by reading it to everybody now. A hawk circling, circling, above the grassy fields, circling, circling. I'd really like you to go and have a look at this poem as well because it has some very interesting punctuation and punctuation is something we're going to look at next year. And now on to place names. It is a really interesting episode, I think. And I hope you'll agree. As I said before, we're going to go all around the world to places you'll know and some that you'll have to look up like we did. What I hope we do is to showcase place names and Very good haiku and senryu too. As usual, I'll start with previously published haiku. Poem first, poet second. So fasten your seatbelts, because we're off on our travels. Utah Beach. Standing where he stood years ago. Debbie Olson, Frog Pond, 41-2. Mount Everest, the way your bones shoulder sky. Debbie Strange, from Brass Bell, in September 2014. Mersey Tunnel, I see to the end of his yawn. Marilyn Ward, the Haiku P Podcast, Series 2, Episode 22. Now we go to the unpublished section of our podcast to highlight your original work. And as usual, I had three wonderful members of our community who volunteered to be community judges. And we're going to start the podcast this week with one of the nominations for the judge's choice, this time from Mark Farrar. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. 
No, thanks for having me, Patricia. Pleasure. And thank you for taking the time to read through all the chosen submissions and prepare your commentary for us. So tell us, which poem did you choose? Okay. After lengthy consideration, I did manage to choose the following as my favourite. So I'm a short list of about 10 the excellent hiking. Now this is by J.L. Huffman. Haiti earthquake, a doll in the rubble, orphaned. Haiti earthquake, a doll in the rubble, orphaned. I find the overall effect of this one incredibly poignant. What I love about it is how the second line takes a completely different direction than I expected, and how the final line is open to different interpretations. Is it the doll that's orphaned? In which case it's sad, of course, because it might mean the child to whom it belonged is now dead, or, or may be missing. Or is it directly talking about the doll's owner, who is orphaned because his or her parents are now dead or missing? Or maybe it's even both. As for the location of the earthquake, the one in Haiti a short time ago is only the most recent of a never-ending series of such tragedies. There have been other, more destructive ones, and there will, of course, undoubtedly be more in the future. But what I think makes the Haiti one memorable is the fact that the country is rife with poverty, and its population having their homes and lives devastated by such a disaster just makes it all the more heartbreaking. I really love haiku that make you think particularly about life and death and how fragile it all is. And this one, I think, succeeds wonderfully. Yeah, I agree. There's a, there's a certain depth to this one, Mark. Possibly the combination of the use of the place name to create the link with our memories, which you mentioned, combined with the use of Mono no Aware, whereby we, the reader has a certain empathy with the doll and what it symbolises. As you said, we don't know if, she, if the thing that is orphaned is the doll or the, the child that owned the doll. So we become as readers, aware of the fleeting, impermanent nature of life. It's, it's very moving. Thank you, Mark. Oh, you're welcome. The mist up and down, round and round, the road to Big Sur. Mimi Ahern. Cadillac Ranch, the deep crimson of sunset, Joshua Gage. Dad casts again, in our bucket the wild smell of Lake Minawana, Nick Hoffman. Mission bells, the swallows return to San Juan Capistrano. Bona M. Santos. From the Grand Canyon, we turn away for the last time, tears in our eyes. Giddy Nielsen Sweep. Brilliant orange sky fades to midnight blue, Grand Canyon sunset. Veronica Hosking. Apre Mardi Gras. The sidewalk skillet sizzles with onions. John S. Green. I love the sounds in that one, John. Over Gettysburg, storm clouds charging the sky, blue and grey. Joshua St. Clair. Paper mill lock, cloudburst in each lift, of the oarsman's paddle. Robert Kingston. Chicago school. Abandoned parrots seek warmth under the stadium lights. Doris Lynch. Admitting defeat from the August sun. Taku Glacier. Pam Joy. Lake Hood, the float plane ripples the cloud. Marcy Weasels. Sir Turner Island Roadblock, searching cars for carrion. Turkey vultures. Alison Douglas Turner. 
Woonsocket Sand, Building Castles Out of Memories Nicole Tilde Monarch butterflies flutter on Pacific Grove breezes. Sanctuary safe. Kath Wren Falling water, finding peace and quiet. Song Beach Ronald K. Craig Union Bound Memories of Sweet Apples from Our Backyard Tree Pat Gear Another Breaking Shelf We Fail to Fix Antarctica Tracy Davidson I'd just like to interrupt the poetry here to say some thank yous. Robert Horobin and James Young really work hard to edit all the submissions, and for place names they were joined by Ron Craig. Thanks to all three of you for doing this. We have approximately 600 poems to read through a month, so it's no small undertaking. Now, as you know, the podcast and all the extra bits and bobs offered by Poetry P, apart from the journal, are offered free. But that doesn't mean there's no cost involved, and so I'm always grateful when you buy me coffees. And at the moment, I'm sorely in need of a new microphone. Good microphones are a wee bit expensive, but with your help, I'm 50% of the way to being able to afford a new one. My sincere thanks for my August coffees. Go to Karen Harvey, Amanda Ferguson, Linda L. Ludwig, Hannah Hulbert, Jason Furtak, Richard L. Matter, Mimi Ahern, Kristen Lindquist, Pat Gear, Chris Dean, Wendy Ghent, Anthony Williams, John Green, Alison Douglas Turner, Steve Barr, JL Huffman, Matt Snyder, and Nick Hoffman. Cheers, chaps. Now back to the poetry, because after all, that's what we're all about. The rising moon across the Bay of Tarifa, casting reflections. Catherine E. Winnick Pitch black night, turtles flip, talang talang's soft white sand. Christina Chin Oh, Christina, I wish I could see some soft white sand just now. Morning eclipse, crows fall silent on the Somme. Dorothy Burroughs. Rising from a Wrocław pavement, lost generation. Kim Russell. Istanbul sunset, from a minaret to another, the call to prayer. Anna Maria Domburg San Cristoforo. Rising and falling, I catch echoes from Mount Luz waterfall. Anna Yin Hiroshima Under the Sakura Fallen Memories Mona Bedi Rashomon The shadow of the bell swings soundlessly Eugenius Sikarsky If the Mishima Shrine is mist enshrouded how can we find it? Ian Speed West African Monsoon A Big Striped Umbrella Saves the Watermelon Feast Christine Wink Harrison Sydney Harbour The sails at the Opera House Fill with Wind Song Angela Terry Clouds Part Mount Fuji Fills My Eyes Nina Singh Nara Shrine Steam Rising from Sleeping Deer Bill Fay A Prayer and a Smoke Sinner's Shrine Marilyn Ashbell Evening Puja The Monk's Horns Part the Golden Clouds Sagamantha Robert Whitmer 
Insects for lunch. Carpathian marsh frogs. Roberta Beach Jacobson. Refugees swarm into Mexico. A million monarchs. Ravi Kiran. In an old orchard, bleached bones jutting out. The killing fields. Bruce H. Feingold. Bruce, I've been trying to write a haiku about that for years, but still haven't come anywhere near writing a poem as good as that one. Thank you. Blue Crane, Dreaming Myself Back to Koh Samui. Isabella Kramer. Next it's time for another of our nominations for the judge's choice, this time from Angela Terry. Unfortunately, Angela and I just couldn't get together to record her reading, so I'm going to read her commentary to you. So just pretend you're listening to Angela. But Angela, I'm really grateful to you for doing this for us. This is the poem she chose. Kashmir Sunset the expanse of saffron, above and below. Kashmir sunset, the expanse of saffron, above and below. Vandana Parashar. There were about ten haiku in this group that pulled me, each in different directions, and any one of them could easily have been my first choice. However, there's something about Kashmir which has always drawn me. Maybe it's simply a sense of it floating somewhere in the clouds like a mirage or Shangri-La always off in the distance. I've been incredibly fortunate in my life to have been able to travel to many parts of the world, but I've never had the opportunity to visit Kashmir. And maybe that's why it casts its spell on me. I know the reality on the ground is far different from my imagined lake filled with houseboats and flowers, with the scent of spices and rose perfume, and with saffron sunsets and towering mountains in the distance. Instead, there's the terror of Rumor Godden's memoir, the horror of the partition, and the bloodshed from the continuous territorial conflicts of the last 75 years. But still, there's something about it that calls out to me from the mists of time. This haiku is part of that call, with its vivid description of a sunset in glorious technicolour, I see the sun slowly falling through that brilliant sky and the lake awaiting to catch it at just the right moment, setting the sky and water aglow with that red-gold light. Saffron is the perfect word to use here. And the S sounds in the first two lines add to the sense of a broad expanse. This haiku has transported me for a few moments at least to a different and glorious place. Angela, I read this and I had the same reaction as you. I was unable to travel to Kashmir when I was in that part of the world due to local unrest and the UK Foreign Office recommending you didn't go there. But I would really, really like to go there one day. It's definitely on my bucket list. Along with many of the places in today's podcast. Thanks, Angela. Himalayan sun on the snow-capped mountains a sea of blue poppies. Basali Chatterjee Dud. Cradling its bravest child, the Karakoram, Zara Mugis. Even in the Rawal Lake, how I long for the old Rawal Lake, when a Himalayan bulbul sings, Hifsa Ashraf. Winter twilight, mist climbing the western ghats. Amrutha Prabhu. Golconda Fort, our claps echoing in the past. Minal Sarosh. Kombakonam dawn, in every breath of every breeze, a temple bell. Srinivas S. Dharamsala, stretching to the horizon, the prayer flags. Cherry A. 
Wagga. A whiff of the familiar wafts across the border. Joe Sebastian. Joe, I really like the rhythm and the sound of that one. River Ganges. Above the dead bodies, blowflies. Milan Rajkumar. Ganga Arathi. On the banks of Haridwar, another starlit sky. Lakshmi Aya. Each petal holds a cloud. Lotus Temple. Teji Sethi. Mumbai Local. A rainbow halts at the platform for a minute. Avinda Kaur. Afghanistan. All the butterflies clinging to the last flower. James Young. Afghanistan. The planes taking off after the prayer. Bakhtiar Amini. Shades pulled on the train to Berlin. A guard takes my camera. Richard Tice. Montezuma Castle. Cottonwood canopies hide the sky. Kathleen Tice. Anchor Watt. The Stone Buddha's final repose. J. Friedenberg. Lake Miyagase, the rice dam in my curry. Deborah P. Kologi. Fairy Creek, young limbs link around old growth. P. H. Fisher. Horseshoe Canyon, sunlight glances off the rim of your glasses. Debbie Strange. Great Divide. Tiny blooms grip the tundra tight against the wind. B sharp. Philadelphia. This blue sky day may be truly brotherly love. Kelly J. White. On the dock, feet dangling over ice. Key West daydreams. B.A. France Campfire Stories, The Giant Sequoia Knows by Heart Lorraine A. Padden Seattle, Your Syllables Drops of Rain Jeff M. Pope Evening Commute, The Sun Crawls Across the Brooklyn Bridge M. Shane Pruitt East Side Cemetery, a lunch hour walk away from traffic sounds. Valentina Rinaldi Adams. Honeymoon Bay, promises built in sand castles. Dale Bennett. Sleepy Hollow, lichen eroding a forgotten name. Pippa Phillips. Yosemite scenes, black and white mastery caught in perfect light. Richard Bailey Dixie wildfires, the afternoon turns into midnight. Christine L. Villa Mississippi, never been there, but I love the name. Charles Harmon Downtown L.A. Sports cars skid through Skid Row. Christopher Pays. A small town girl. High rise canyons. New York City. Linda L. Ludwig. Linda. I think this poem really expresses very well how I felt the first time I went to New York even though I was a Londoner, so hardly a small-town girl. But it's, it's truly something else, isn't it? 
Catskill Mountain Dew, my whole life contained within these peaks and valleys. Sorry, grand stuff. South Carolina Sunday. Shock cords hold the beer cooler shut. David Oates. Dawning, not dawned. The sun announces herself over the capital. Matt Snyder. Fresh after rain, how green Abriachan forest smells. Kevin McNeil. Dover Cliffs, the sheer audacity of seagulls. Paul Callis. I wonder if Paul has ever had his chips nicked by the seagulls. I know I have. Waiting for him on Hyde Park Corner. Thunderstorm. Mariangela Canzi. Avocet beak curves towards cloud, towards Winchelsea. Amanda Ferguson. Oh, Amanda. Winchelsea, that brings back some memories of youth. Cashtown move. Ancestral seat calling to far away. Rob McKinnon. And congratulations to Rob for giving me probably the hardest words to try and pronounce. And I do apologise to everyone for how I've mangled other words too. Sky dusk. The summer moon full of pub tunes. Brett Brady Saltburn by the sea Distant clouds pierce a gull's wing Marilyn Ward Rotherslade at high tide Decision time Sue Young The Tyne Bridge spanning generations Kitty Wakes and Kids Eric Nicholson Land's End Sunset. Everything is made of waves. Christine. The Hawthorns hold the bird. We play football. Richard Downs. An ant marching from Mayfair to Old Kent Road. Tony Williams. Tony, I'm going to dedicate this to my family who absolutely love playing Monopoly. Old Red Post Box. The last Winterburn swallows quaver on a wire. Claire Ninham. Crossing the Severn, sensing the river swell. Another one flown. Wendy Ghent. On the Crickieth coast, we hold tight to our chip forks. C.X. Turner Scrambling up a stegosaurus's spine. Helvellyn. E.L. Forest High tide slapping the bridge. River Usk. Anne Smith Molten flares grasp the steel grey. Port Talbot. Stephen Stokes. Shannon River Sunset. The orange and yellow of meadow butterflies. Douglas J. Lanzo. Douglas, as I told you, my, my mother comes from near where the Shannon River rises. And whenever I think of the river, I think of being chased by a herd of terribly vicious-looking cows as I went to see what is known as the Shannon Pot. Top of the Triglo, already outside Slovenia, my thoughts. Samo Kreutz. Holocaust Museum, his hometown a dot on an SS camp map. 
Elaine Wilbert Cologne Cathedral A choir tests the Gothic acoustics Krista Pandy Thorn City In the history of Trnava, blooming roses Ava Drobner Svalbard Island Whitewashed nights on frozen ground. Editor Strizenkova. St. Petersburg. Those sleepless white nights and my first love. Natalia Kuznetsova. No end in sight. Gods too flee Olympus wildfire. Sherry Grant. Even in the rain, I love walking the empty streets of Paris. Maya Daneva Père Lachaise We argue all the way to Abelard's grave. Kristen Lindquist The sunflowers on the Lamartine Place. Van Gogh Yellow Lafcadio Chamomile tea. The full moon slowly fills Paris sky. Laughing waters. I too lean to connect. Tower of Pisa. Melanie Vance. Blinded by the light at the end of the tunnel. Lago di Como. Marion Clark. Bomarzo Park, Under the Green Moss, Secrets, Daniela Miso. A rainbow breaks through the storm clouds of the rear, Hannah Hulbert. Ending our podcast this time is Richard Tice's nomination for the judge's choice. Richard, welcome back. Well, thank you for inviting me. This was a treat. <laughs> Good. And I wondered, as you, in, you introduced this topic for us, how did you view the submissions that we, we chose in the end? I was delighted, actually, uh, overall. Uh, I always realize there's a problem with uh, place names that uh, may be unfamiliar. But I took the time to look up everything, which was probably about one fourth, maybe even one third. I'm amazed that the judges were able to make selections <laughs> about places they'd never heard of. And in many cases, uh, finding out what the place was added quite a bit to the poll. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think that was the difficulty we had once we started looking at it the practicality of looking up everything I mean thank goodness we had Google and I know the the editing team did use it quite a bit some of them were familiar with with some of the places obviously but not all of them so I can quite understand now why place names are not widely used I guess it depends on whether the editor has the time or the inclination to go ahead and and look them up. But I enjoyed doing it. I thought it was a wonderful es escape through the world. I mean, you, you've seen all the submissions and you know we went all over the place. So I I'm glad you enjoyed reading them. Would you like to tell us which one caught your fancy? Ultimately, I chose Isabella Mori's haiku. Tashme, through the wildfire haze, my eyes swim in tears. But my way into this poem was askew. I passed over the first line because I was unfamiliar with Tashme. I figured it must be a place near a wildfire and I was immediately sympathetic because of the shocking proliferation of fires throughout the world this year and last year. I was then caught by the last line, normally direct expressions of emotion and in haiku alienate me. 
much uh, less poetic cliches like I swimming in tears. Here, however, the tears brimming over are caused by the stinging smoke. So it's a natural and clever play with the stock phrase. I can relate to this too because of thick smoke I experienced last year that set my eyes watering uncontrollably. I could also appreciate the sibilant sounds of ash, haze, eyes, swim, and tears that unite the poem and underscore its emotion. Then I looked up Tashme and the haiku opened up. Tashme was an internment camp of Japanese Canadians from 1942 to 1946 in British Columbia, a year after the war ended, northeast of Vancouver with a peak population of more than 2,600. I had not thought that Canada had created concentration camps like those in the US euphemistically called relocation camps in this country. Tashme was especially egregious because after the war, reparation involved choosing to go east, deeper into Canada, or to go to Japan, though most Japanese Canadians had never seen that country. The government had already sold their goods, homes, businesses, and properties. So two large fires have affected that area this year. The poet may be visiting Tashme or the museum there and suffering from the smoke blanketing the area. Or perhaps she's elsewhere, like Vancouver, in a place affected by smoke. Either way, she feels a strong connection to the camp and the suffering of its inhabitants. Perhaps as Kim, Kim, uh, the last name is Mori, or one who has learned some Tashme stories. That connection brings her to tears, which she conveniently blames on the smoke. How many years must pass before Tashme enters my moral consciousness, and I too can cry over its injustices? It was actually a, a fascinating story, wasn't it, Tashme? Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you highlighted that because it was uh, very moving to read it. It is one of the places I looked up as I was going through. Thank you very much, Richard. So now it's time to get the judges to get together and decide which is the judge's choice and which are the honourable mentions. Now it's time for the judges to decide which is the judge's choice and which the honourable mentions. Congratulations to all our nominees this month. You'll find out how they got on in the Autumn Journal, planned for December. I'm really going to have to start numbering them rather than calling them a season, aren't I? Fancy. Autumn in December. Well, that's a job for next year. And so, that's it for this time. Thank you to all my wonderful poets, to our editing team, to our judges, and to you for coming along and listening. Don't forget to send your haiku and senryu to Poetry P. Topics and deadlines are on the submissions 2021 page on the website. And if you've not signed up for the mailing, please do go to the website and do so. You might miss out on some special things coming soon. Just time to remind you that next time it's the podcast's birthday. Four years. Do come along and hear some new voices, as well as me, of course. But in the meantime, don't forget, keep writing. If I've left anything out, or I've got something wrong this time, please don't be afraid to tell me via email. I'll find a way to sort it out. Until next time, ciao!